Last week in Geneva, Russian Foreign Minister uh, Lavrov and I met to discuss the crisis instigated by Russia's military buildup on Ukraine's borders and steps to de-escalate tensions and pursue diplomacy. Uh, Russia had previously outlined its concerns and proposals in writing, and last week I told Foreign Minister Lavrov that the United States would do the same. Today, Ambassador Sullivan delivered our written response in Moscow. All told, it sets out a serious diplomatic path forward, should Russia choose it. The document we've delivered includes concerns of the United States and our allies and partners about Russia's actions that undermine security, a principled and pragmatic evaluation of the concerns that Russia has raised, and our own proposals for areas where we may be able to find common ground. We make clear that there are core principles that we are committed to uphold and defend, including Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, and the right of states to choose their own security arrangements and alliances. We've addressed the possibility of reciprocal transparency measures regarding force posture in Ukraine, as well as measures to increase confidence regarding military exercises and maneuvers in Europe. Ah, and we address other areas where we see potential for progress, including arms control related to missiles in Europe, our interest in a follow-on agreement to the New START Treaty that covers all nuclear weapons, and ways to increase transparency and stability. We put these ideas forward because they have the potential, if negotiated in good faith, to enhance our security and that of our allies and partners, while also addressing Russia's stated concerns through reciprocal commitments. Our response to Russia reflects what I said in Kyiv, Berlin, and Geneva last week. We're open to dialogue. We prefer diplomacy. And we're prepared to move forward where there is the possibility of communication and cooperation if Russia de-escalates its aggression toward Ukraine, stops the inflammatory rhetoric, and approaches discussions about the future of security in Europe in a spirit of reciprocity. Our responses were fully coordinated with Ukraine and our European allies and partners, with whom we've been consulting continuously for weeks. We sought their input and incorporated it into the final version delivered to Moscow. Additionally, NATO developed and will deliver to Moscow its own paper with ideas and concerns about collective security in Europe, and that paper fully reinforces ours and vice versa. There's no daylight among the United States and our allies and partners on these matters. We shared our response paper with Congress, and I'll be briefing congressional leaders on this later today and consulting with them on our approach. As you know, there's strong bipartisan interest and deep expertise on the Hill when it comes to Ukraine and Russia, and we very much appreciate having Congress as a partner as we move forward. We're not releasing the document publicly because we think that diplomacy has the best chance to succeed if we provide space for confidential talks. We hope and expect that Russia will have the same view and will take our proposal seriously. I expect to speak to Foreign Minister Lavrov in the coming days after Moscow has had a chance to read the paper and is ready to discuss next steps. There should be no doubt about our seriousness of purpose when it comes to diplomacy, and we're acting with equal focus and force to bolster Ukraine's defenses and prepare a swift, united response to further Russian aggression. Three deliveries of U.S. defensive military assistance arrive in Kyiv this week, carrying additional Javelin missiles and other anti-armor systems. 283 tons of ammunition and non-lethal equipment essential to Ukraine's frontline defenders. More deliveries are expected in the days to come. We provided more defensive security assistance to Ukraine in the past year than in any previous year. Last week, I authorized U.S. allies, including Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, to provide U.S. origin military equipment from their inventories for use by Ukraine. Also last week, we notified Congress of our intent to deliver to Ukraine the MI-17 helicopters currently held in Defense Department inventories, five of them. Additionally, the Secretary of Defense announced on Monday that 8,500 U.S. service members currently stationed in Europe and the United States have been placed in heightened readiness, heightened readiness to deploy, to ensure that we're able to support the NATO response force swiftly if it's activated by the North Atlantic Council to harden the Allies' eastern flank. Other NATO allies have also announced steps that they're prepared to take, and we expect more in the coming days. We've taken this step out of prudence. Uh, we hope those forces don't have to be activated for deployment. But if they are, we will be ready. 
We're also continuing to coordinate with our European allies and partners on severe economic sanctions to hold Moscow accountable for its actions. We've developed a high-impact, quick-action response that would inflict significant costs on the Russian economy and financial system. As part of our response, we're also prepared to impose export controls that will have a longer-term effect, denying Russia products that it needs to fulfill its strategic ambitions. On top of all of that, our allies and partners are also stepping up to provide assistance to Ukraine in various and mutually reinforcing ways. As we've done many times before, the alliance and individual allies are coming together to support our partners and to defend what should be inviolable principles that have helped provide unprecedented security, stability and prosperity for decades in Europe and around the world. Finally, we're looking to support our allies and partners in dealing with the secondary negative consequences of Russia's destabilizing acts. For example, we know that Ukraine's economy and financial position is being affected by this crisis. And just as we're bolstering Ukraine's security, so too are we looking for how we can support its economy beyond the significant assistance we're already provided. Our European allies and partners are doing so as well. And that's another matter that I'll have an opportunity to discuss with Congress later this afternoon. Uh, as we're taking steps to ensure that uh, the global energy supply isn't disrupted. Uh, that, too, is an important focus. Should Russia choose to weaponize its natural gas by cutting supply to Europe even more than it's already done? We're in discussions with governments and major producers around the world about surging their capacity. We're engaged in detailed conversations with our allies and partners about coordinating our response, including how best to deploy their existing energy stockpiles. All this effort is aimed at mitigating price shocks, and ensuring that people in the United States, Europe, and around the world have the energy they need, no matter what Russia decides to do. All told, our actions over the past week have sharpened the choice facing Russia now. We've laid out a diplomatic path. We've lined up steep consequences should Russia choose further aggression. We've stepped forward with more support for Ukraine's security and economy. And we and our allies and partners are united across the board. Now, we'll continue to press forward and prepare. It remains up to Russia to decide how to respond. We're ready either way. One final note before I take some questions. Regarding American citizens in Ukraine, as you know, earlier this week, I authorized the voluntary departure of a limited number of U.S. employees and ordered the departure of many family members of embassy personnel from Ukraine. This was a decision based on one factor only, the safety and security of our colleagues and their families. And given the continued massive buildup of Russian forces on Ukraine's borders, which has many indications of preparations for an invasion, these steps were the prudent ones to take. I want to be clear that our embassy in Kyiv will remain open and we continue to maintain a robust presence to provide diplomatic, economic and security support to Ukraine. The State Department has also issued an updated travel advisory due to the potential for security conditions to deteriorate rapidly and without warning if Russia invades or commits other destabilizing actions inside Ukraine. Our message now for any Americans in Ukraine is to strongly consider leaving using commercial or other privately available transportation options. These options remain readily available. And the embassy may extend loans to those who can't afford the cost of a commercial ticket. While the State Department will always seek to provide consular services wherever possible, Russian military action would severely impact our ability to perform that work. And if Russia invades, civilians, including Americans still in Ukraine, could be caught in a conflict zone between combatant forces. The U.S. government may not be in a position to aid individuals in these circumstances. This has long been the case in conflict zones around the world. So, while we don't know whether Russia will continue its aggression toward Ukraine, either way, we have a responsibility to provide this notice to Americans there. And with that, happy to take some questions.